Hi, I'm Ted Swicky, and in this presentation I'll be talking about the importance of testing in producing phytophthora-free nursery plants. In this case, we're talking primarily about soil-borne phytophthora species that cause root rots, as opposed to aerial phytophthora like sudden oak death pathogen phytophthora remorum. So the first question is, why should we be concerned about these Phytophthora species? Soil-borne Phytophthora species, although cryptic in many ways, can cause very severe diseases in plants and have been shown in California to be quite devastating to certain native plant communities, such as the uh, I own Manzanita plant community seen here, which is infested by the exotic pathogen Phytophthora cinnamomi, which causes pretty much entire mortality of the stand and in a way that, that is essentially irreversible. Phytophthora cinnamomi produces long-lived spores that can reside in the soil for many years, and therefore the regeneration of this plant is killed over time, so the areas where the, they become infested never do support the manzanita in the future. Other plant species are also affected by this particular phytophthora as well as others. These are madrones dying in a forest setting in Northern California. Madrones quite susceptible to phytophthora cinnamomi as are a number of other co-occurring species such as California Bay in this forest. And that causes widespread forest decline in these areas. We also know that the spread of phytophthora can occur quite readily from nursery plants that have grown under non-phytosanitary conditions as is the norm in, in the nursery industry. Even in restoration plantings where phytophthora infected nursery plants are planted, we have seen spread of phytophthora to native site vegetation, especially located in the downhill direction from those infested plantings. In this particular situation in Santa Clara County, expansion from a, an older planting done 20 plus years ago has expanded to many hectares below the, the original plantings and affected a wide variety of shrub species, toyons, various other uh, ceanothus, and including some tree species, including California Bay and others. Introductions via nursery stock are very serious and have serious implications for the sustaining of these systems. In the case of this particular situation, Arctostaphylos hookeri, subspecies raven eye, um, there was only actually one clone left, this large, mostly dead area here now. In a well-meaning attempt to try to expand the, the species in its area, cuttings were taken, grown in nurseries, those nursery plants were infected, they were replanted at this site, and that phytophthora spread to attack and mostly kill the original clone. So oh, there are a number of reasons why we need to be concerned about phytophthora, and especially relative to restoration. Uh, because the nursery stock that's produced in conventional nursery situations has a very high risk of introducing phytophthora. Across a number of different studies, we know there's a wide variety of phytophthora species that have been introduced, including multiple species that have not previously been even described or have not been previously found in California or in the United States. They're associated with a wide variety of native plant species in these sites. We've seen them in northern and California sites in locations that are wet to dry, so they have wide adaptability to a lot of different situations. So what can we do to prevent this, this outcome? Really, the, the solution is to produce and use phytophthora-free nursery stock. As indicated here, um, this is something you can't see in many cases until it's too late. The same solution is fairly simple in terms of producing clean plants. You start with clean materials, all the inputs being clean, and you keep it clean during the production process. And we helped develop a series of BMPs and a program or based on the, those BMPs for accrediting nurseries to, for clean plant production. And the program involved there, the Accreditation to Improve Restoration Program, has the overall goal to protect native vegetation and habitats by making sure that we aren't introducing Phytophthora in plantings that can work their way down into the native vegetation and end up with situations like this, because restoration does not look like this. We do not restore an area if we introduce these destructive pathogens that can kill both native vegetation that was on the site as well as the plantings themselves. So one might wonder about, we have a Phytophthora compliant, BMP compliant nursery, how much Phytophthora can we really tolerate 
in the stock? What's an acceptable limit for the phytophthora that's in there? And the answer really is none. Uh, we, we're going to prevent phytophthora introduction by a nursery stock. We can't be moving phytophthora out of these nurseries with the nursery stock. So why can we not have anything in the nursery? It really goes down to the principles of, of plant diseases. Uh, typically, the plant disease pyramid is a slightly expanded version of the plant disease triangle, indicating that susceptible host in the presence of a, of a, susceptible, of a virulent pathogen causes disease under favorable environmental conditions, yet those conditions exist for a certain period of time. In the case of nursery production, all the conditions that exist in nurseries are exceptionally favorable for the diseases caused by phytophthora that cause root rot. So nurse, plant nurseries provide almost optimal conditions for phytophthora diseases, which is why we really have to have a zero tolerance type of situation for having these plants in the nursery. One reason we have to have a zero tolerance type of approach to phytophthora in nurseries is that phytophthora spreads so readily between closely placed containers that we find in nursery situations. In this situation, we inoculated one central plant in this tray of colleague cherries and put them on a nursery bench where they were irrigated as per normal practices. 110 days after that, if we look at this flat, we can see that the central inoculated plant is dead, and we see several other missing plants or dead plants in this area as well. But if we actually bait these plants individually, we can see that all the pairs in this lot, with the exception of the three in this corner, are actually tested positive for the presence of Phytophthora. If we go back to the flat, we can see these three, and two of these are long dead plants. Those could be false negatives, as we'll talk about a little more later. And maybe this one in the corner wasn't infected. So 24 out of 25 plants at minimum in just about three months from one single infected plant in the tray to begin with. The other thing to note is that most of these plants that are infected are not really showing obvious shoot symptoms. And this gets to another whole issue. It's a very typical IPM practice is to scout for the presence of pests and diseases. Okay, so can we use scouting to eliminate phytophthora infected plants in the nursery? The answer to that is actually no, because it's really both too little and too late. We detect too little of the phytophthora that's out there by scouting. And what we do detect is it's at such a late stage that it's not very useful for managing on an exclusionary basis in the nursery. As an example of this, here's three toyons growing one gallon pot. And you might wonder with whether any of these were infected with phytophthora. The actual answer is they're all infected. The two outside ones have essentially no healthy roots on them to speak of. The center one has a few, but as you knock that root system out, you can see there's only a few tiny roots holding that plant together. Point is that with these drought tolerant plants, you can have almost a complete root disease. You can actually have total root disease for some period of time before the top will collapse, partly because nursery environment is cool generally and moist. Um, and those things allow these drought tolerant plants to persist, even if their root systems are severely compromised. Here's another example. Um, this is an inoculation test using an unknown Phytophthora species, uh, undescribed species that was recovered from nursery plants. Here are the plants that we're going to use before the inoculation. The three on the left then are inoculated. If we look at 115 days later, we can see both sets have grown and the symptoms on the inoculated ones are not clearly obvious. They're not, not inoculated, inoculated, look very similar. However, we were consistently baiting during this whole period phytophthora from these inoculated plants. So they were shedding inoculum. And if we look at the root systems at this end period at 115, we can see that especially in the bottom of the root system, that say the most saturated, we have moderate to severe root decay in the inoculated ones compared to the non-inoculated controls where we have much more healthy roots at the very bottom of the root zone. So the problem with this is these plants are, could be planted out into a, a field situation and might survive for an extended period. And during that whole period, they can produce more inoculum that has, has the potential to be spread out into the planting area and beyond. So there's no real advantage in planting uh, these infected plants. And there's obviously very severe disadvantage. One of the other issues we have in nurseries is 
because symptoms can be kind of vague, we can have plants that actually are showing symptoms, but they aren't recognized. So for instance, here's a, a bunch of uh, monardellas that look, you know, not overly great, but you know, that maybe is because they're going a little bit dormant, they don't like the mix very well, they were too shaded, they were too sunny, whatever. All these nursery types of explanations might work. They might also be uniformly infected with Phytophthora, so they would all look the same, and they would all look a little funky. And that's actually what's the case. These were definitely infected. The whole purpose of the nursery Phytophthora BMPs or MP BMPs uh, and the AIR program is to use a clean production process that excludes Phytophthora. And so if you don't have Phytophthora in the nursery, you don't have to control it. You basically are excluding it. Testing serves as a check on the implementation of your, of your BMPs and also helps you identify problems early if some sort of exception should occur that actually allowed an accidental introduction to occur. So it could be found early enough to prevent widespread contamination. Now, testing for Phytophthora, all test methods, whether we're looking at Phytophthora or anything else, have limitations. And one of our most serious ones, if we're looking for this clean production system, is false negative results. No detection when Phytophthora is really present. And these are really the most common types of, of of errors that we see. And there's a number of different things that can cause that. Basically, it comes down to there not being enough of the pathogen in the actual sample that's tested to have it show up. Uh, that's the most common thing. That might be because the plants were very recently contaminated, so only a few roots are infected, or the inoculum's in there, but it hasn't even caused infections yet. Um, the sample's too small to capture the small levels, or you just happen to be, many times we don't have uniform infection. So if you don't pick the right roots or the right plants, you might not have infected material in your sample. Also, plants are dead for an extended period, or the roots are dead for a long time. Secondary organisms can sometimes overwhelm whatever phytophthora was in there and make it more difficult to detect it. And some tests just are not as efficient as others. So if you're using a less efficient test, things like antibody test strips tend to be not as sensitive you're just going to have negatives that are they're not really true negatives. Because false negatives can occur, especially with low sampling, if you have a single negative test result, it is really not definitive. And this is a mistake some people make, is that they do one test, the test comes out negative, they say, okay, these plants are clean. Well, we don't have as much confidence in a negative test just because there are a lot of ways we can have false negative results. So we really want to replicate a negative test multi times with either multiple replicates from the same batch or repeated testing, particularly in a critical situation. On the other hand, positive test results are much more meaningful. So we have this kind of asymmetry where we have a positive test, and particularly for something that doesn't produce a false positive, that's much more meaningful than a negative tests or even a couple of negative tests. Some tests also can produce false positive results is not seen in all tests. Things like ELISA tests, antibody type tests can sometimes cross react with other related organisms so you can get a positive result when there's no phytophthora present. And that's problematic. Um, but if we use methods like baiting and culturing where the pathogen is recovered and identifiable and we can't really have false positive results because you can't detect, you can't actually have it in your hand and, and identify it if it hasn't been there to begin with. In terms of other limitations, cost and effort to, to do adequate sampling and testing may be high. We have thousands and thousands of plants. The other issue is that some pesticides used in normal commercial nurseries that suppress phytophthora can interfere with some tests, like things that involve baiting or isolation. So we worked on a method to efficiently test large numbers of nursery plants using kind of known principles in, in recovery of phytophthora from nursery plants and other plants. This bench leachate baiting test is a type of a baiting methodology. It has a lot of advantages over a lot of tests. It's non-destructive. We can test individual plants or groups of plants using this method. There are no false positives. We actually re recover the pathogen in the test. The detection is epidemiologically meaningful. And what we mean by that is that if we actually detect in the test, we're actually detecting live infective inoculum, enough to infect the bait, and if it's enough to infect the bait, it's enough to infect other things, and it is actually being dispersed from those plants every time you irrigate. 
Even so, this test can be uh, conducted by a nursery with simple equipment. It's not that complicated to run in many ways. And it can work across a wide range of container sizes. In this right corner, we have some number 15 containers that are being irrigated. Each irrigation for this pot size takes eight liters. For a test of six containers, that's 288 liters of water. In comparison, down here, these small SC7 containers only take 20 mils per pot. Um, that would be 2.4 liters for a 20 container test, or if we were testing an individual pot, which you can do, um, you're only talking about 0.12 liters, and that's a 2400 fold difference from, from this test here, 280 liters compared to 0.12 liters. Now we make that adjustment by essentially scaling the amount of irrigation to the container volume. Each of the calibrated irrigation is done at 15 minute intervals and each irrigation essentially uses about 17 percent of the container volume and we round them slightly. This test primarily re relies on the fact that on infected rooting moist conditions which you have in nursery, Phytophthora species produce fruiting structures called sporangia. The sporangia under wet conditions can release swimming zoospores. Zoospores have two flagella on them and the zoospores swim out of the sporangia under saturated condition, move in water in, in water films, and actively are attracted to host materials like root. So that's our primarily primary agent that we're detecting in this test. However, other structures that may be washed out in debris from the from the test do potentially contribute. Those could include clematospores and oospores or other infested root debris in the bottom of the vessel. So this is how this test works. We're irrigating these plants, and in the process of doing that, zoospores, along with other spores in the soil and infested debris, is flushed from these containers and is, it works its way into this vessel that we have down below. Zoospores swim upward because that's what zoospores do. They're negatively geotropic, meaning they swim in opposition to the force of gravity, so they always swim upward. So they're going to concentrate near the top of the water column in this vessel here. They're also going to be attracted to the bait that is floating on the top of that water column and they'll swim actively towards that. So all this is happening during the, the baiting period. When we have more water than will fit in that container, and that container is only a, a two gallon container, so it's not going to hold a lot of runoff. What we do is that excess water is, is exiting via this elevated drain from the lower portion of the of the water column. So we're not washing the zoospores out the top as which would happen if we just let the it keep the overflowing from the top. So again, we've seen some pictures of this, but we set our plants up above some kind of catchment which sheets directly into this. We use a little bit of a slide there to cut turbulence so we're not jostling these zoospores around too much. Um, here's the container underneath, the water drips down. We have the bait floating in the, the vessel there. At the end of the test, that bait is transferred and incubated for an additional three days. Lesions develop within three to eight days from the test. And those can then be isolated or the whole pair can be sent to a CDFA lab for a confirmation. So we knew after a few tests that this, this method worked, but what we wanted to do is find out how well it worked to understand the efficiency with what it worked. And we, there are a number of different factors that can affect the, the efficiency of the test. We conducted a number of tests in these controlled arrays, which consisted of one, or in some cases more than one, um, infected plants tucked into a non-infected series of plants. In most cases, we used grasses, which are not hosts of the species we were, we were using, and they were planted in pasteurized soil and clean conditions. So they were not generating inoculum. We were still running water through them. From these tests, we were able to developed this estimated detection probability function, which was used for other models we'll show in the next slide. And what that basically shows that is we have a higher, in the test array, the multiple set of plants that are being tested at once. If almost all of those or all of those plants are infected, we're going to detect Phytophthora at a very high percentage of the time, very close to 100%. Um, and that seems to be pretty level across a range out to around 20%. Once we get below 20% infection level in the array, it starts to drop off fairly rapidly. But we're still somewhere around better than 50% in general 
um, if we have between uh, 2.5 and 5 percent infection level. To actually look at how this factor interacts with other factors, we did some modeling and we had to use Monte Carlo modeling to do this. But if we look at it, at what we are trying to attempt is to, to detect low infection rates. So if we look at a hundred, a thousand plant bats, which is not uncommon in nursery, and have an un, one percent infection rate, well, that means there's only ten infected plants in that whole batch. That means at least one of those has to be in a test array or it won't be detected. We can do all the tests in the world on these on these other plants that are not infected and we're not going to detect. Two things that can affect it, if we start with the simplest situation of random sampling, we just have a bunch of plants, we pull a few at random and we sample them, we can change the number of plants we have in each test. Um, if we increase that, we have a better chance that we get one of these plants in the array. Or we can run multiple tests, and that works in the same way. As we have more tests, we have more chance that at least one of those tests has got an infected plant in it. Now, the other way we can improve our odds is by sampling with bias whenever possible. And then what this means is we're simply sampling plants that are more likely to be infected. So if we see something like this in the nursery, there's a, a patch of dead plants and other plants are around them. Those would be the ones we would want to sample. It turns out this method doesn't work that great with dead plants. We can use a different method for that. But if we're sampling the surviving plants, those around the edges there would be biased. They're more likely to be infected if, in fact, this was a root disease situation here. And we can see that that increases our detection probabilities much higher, faster, even regardless of how many plants we include in the test or how many tests we include. Because what we're effectively doing is we're increasing the percentage or the likelihood that we have a high percentage, higher percentage of plants in the test. Now, if we look at the 5% infection rate, we can see that overall our detection efficiencies are much higher. Um, and again, if we include bias, um, we can be almost certain that we're going to have a detection most of the time. And just to show how this works in a practical situation, we did a, a lot of testing at this nursery K in 2021. It was a nursery that was what we would call partially BMP compliant. They were following a lot of BMP compliant practices, but not all. Depending on the batch, they were either closer to being compliance or farther from being in compliance. But beyond that, they had this situation that they were not a historical nursery that has a lot of potential contamination in the soil. This is more or less a temporary nursery site that was set up on a largely hardscape situation. It didn't have phytophthora present in the soil that could contaminate things. So in a way, it was a lower risk because they had to bring in any phytophthora that showed up there. It wasn't already in the contaminated nursery. We ran 128 leachate tests. We had 20 tests where detections were made. Uh, that's a 15.6% detection rate. We did do some root soil tests and you can see there's a higher detection rate with that overall. Those are done on dead plants, which I mentioned it before, and those are obviously a more biased test. If you have a dead plant, you actually are, you have a better chance that it could be an infected plant. So you can see that that bias by itself changed the, the success rate. If we just look at the leachate test. One thing that showed up is that in general, larger containers, these which are about one gallon and a little bit smaller. We had much more detection in these than we did in the smallest ones. There's a couple of things going on with that, but one of the things that happens, of course, is that the larger plants have been resident in the nursery for a longer time, so there's more chances for contamination to have occurred. The other thing that differs is that not all plants were in all sorts of containers and situations. So if we just look by plant type alone, for monocots and ferns, we had no detections and not a huge number of tests, but more on, on these monocots, all of which, of course, were more on benches. For the woody plant types, we had the highest detections overall. And those are more likely to be phytophthora hosts of a lot of different phytophthoras, where although there may be phytophthoras that pack, and there are ones that pack monocots and ferns, it's possible they just weren't introduced yet into this nursery. In terms of the location, pallets are not a BMP compliant situation and you can see that where we had direct comparisons between bench and pallet, we always had higher infection rates uh, detected in the, in the pallet grown material or material on pallets. And one other thing that's interesting here is that 
the Dorsche, by following some BMPs, overall had a lower infection rate than the material that they, they had some material that for contract reasons they had to buy in. And all the tests of the woody material from those tests were, were positive. And the other thing that's important about that is that the species diversity in terms of the number of phytophthoras in that material was greater than all the other 36 tests that were done on woody plants of the same plant size range. So you can see that bringing contaminated plants into the nursery greatly increases the risk. Because we know these tests are very effective, we can use the, the tests themselves, if you have enough of them, to start looking at, okay, what are the relative risks of these different nursery practices? In the situation of generally non-compliant nurseries, you know, growing plants on the ground or on pallets is they're really not compliant with the BMPs because of risk of contamination. Here's a situation where they're not only not using pasteurized soil, but they actually dump the old, you know, the recycling soil into that. The nursery is following kind of these sketchy practices. You can do a ton of tests in them, but the bottom line is you didn't have to do a lot of tests before you detected phytophthora. You see in most of these we had pretty high detection rates and multiple Phytophthora species in most of these situations. In the case of partially compliant nurseries, nurseries that were generally following BMPs or following most BMPs but had some issue that was resulted in plants being non-compliant, or in the case of nursery K, which we're looking at, having a mixture of compliant and non-compliant practices. But look at those nurseries, we can see that we still detected a lot of Phytophthora in these non-compliant batches, up to 50% in some of these, etc. And from, in some cases, not very many tasks. The overall rate is partly brought down here by the fact that we have some no detects here, but note that one of these no detects is Nursery K in 2020, where we only did seven tasks. And one thing that can happen, as we've talked about with false negatives, is if you don't test enough, or you don't test the right material, you can end up with a false negative. So these nurseries may or may not have been free of contamination in that particular batch, uh, or in those batches of plants that we tested. But overall, the detections there tend to be lower than the nurseries following no practices at all, or almost no practices at all that are compliant with the BMPs. If we look at our fully nursery phytophthora BMP compliant nurseries, many of these were tested multiple years in a row, and we have a huge number of tests in these nurseries. There are 677 reported through 2021, involving almost 25,000 plants. And across all these, there were no detections at all. Also in these nurseries up here, they were tested multiple years in a row and with no detection. This is pretty strong evidence that compared to the partially compliant and generally non-compliant nurseries where we were picking up contamination in most cases in a single set of testing of small numbers provides as much greater evidence that these nurseries were actually free of phytophthora. So all this extensive testing, we're using a validated sensitive method, and it does show that if we're using these, these BMPs and we're implementing them consistently, which is a key, they're effective at excluding phytophthoras from the nursery. And that's really what the, the AIR program is all about. It's based on these science-based BMPs. They all revolve about excluding phytophthora from the production process. It involves nursery evaluations where, where experts will go in and evaluate the, the practices being used by the nurseries and make suggestions to, to improve those. And testing needs to be done for quality control purposes. Our overall objective of the AIR program, any accreditation program, should be to allow nurseries to succeed at consistently producing clean plants. Even in a compliant nursery, there's a lot of risk of phytophthora spread. You can see how closely packed these particular sets of plants are. You really have to have complete exclusion. So we're not talking about less phytophthora. We have to have no phytophthora in these batches because less phytophthora simply becomes more phytophthora more and more phytophthora over time in these situations. Our recommendations, if we have a BMP compliant nursery, testing is done for quality control during production at certain phases. You don't have to test continuously. There are certain points, such as during, right before upsizing or other critical points in production where it makes sense to do your testing uh, as a quality control practice. And also pre-delivery, when the plants are ready to go out, pre-delivery testing really should be done by the client as some kind of as a final check to make sure that these plants are clean and they are compliant. It's also used in the nursery for detecting contamination in higher risk materials, say material that 
comes from divisions or other things like that, or in situations where maybe there was some potential BMP deviation, where you weren't sure whether somebody was following the right practices, or there was a flash event or something else, and you're wondering whether they contaminated these plants. That makes sense to then go in and do some repeated testing on that material. If we're not in BMP compliant nurseries, it's really not effective or practical to try to pick out which plants are infected and which ones are not. And that sometimes people think they can do that. Well, can't we just test and we'll throw away the ones that are infected and keep the rest of them? And that's just really not practical. It doesn't really work. Partly for all the reasons we talked about, including the fact that even we can get, we still can develop false negative results in certain situations. You can do adequate testing in these nurseries to document that you have phytosmic contamination, maybe to help convince these people that they need to do some things to clean up their act. But generally, clean nursery practices are what guarantee you clean stock. It's not the testing that cleans it up. It's making sure that it's clean when it's produced to begin with. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge the, the various entities that have provided funding for various things we've talked about in this talk and various individuals listed here um, who, have, who have also participated in both the AIR program and various other testing and experiments that we've done. Thank you very much.